Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Certainty Talks. On this show, we talk about certainty, a topic that feels more important today than ever before, but all in all, always an important topic. We have my good friend and business partner here in the Well Club, Paul Sparks. He's not only a very successful real estate investor, but also a certified certainty advisor. Now, we do this show because I learned from a wise man that if you look at the last three years of your business by months and turn all those negative months into zeros, what would happen to your bottom line? And we learned that from Dan Nicholson. Now, we are here to achieve financial certainty by rigging the game in your favor. Now, uh, I am on a mission to create 100 millionaires, and the information on the show alone is enough for you to become a millionaire in the next five to seven years. If you'll take consistent action, you will become one. If you get value today, please share this episode right now. That way we can all grow together. And as we talk through these topics, I'm going to ask you guys to keep an open loop Keep an open mind. Don't try to get all these answers resolved right right now. What happens when you try to close this loop? You might get distracted. You might miss some points and so on. So I encourage you guys to have an open loop. And before we get into the topic for today, I want to share my six-word update. So the one I took for this past week was uh, highest month paradigm nearly ruined me. So that's my six-word update. What about you, Paul? Mine is these principles take time to digest. It's, it's what you just said. We have a tendency to want to close the loop on everything. We want to just, you know, get the answers right away. And this was perfectly apparent. We're, we're right in the middle of our cohort number four for the whale club. And, you know, brains are getting melted. Everybody's looking for loops to get closed. And so, you know, what we're doing on this show is we're talking a lot about the same sort of concepts we're covering in the whale club so that you guys can hear these things, but it's so important to keep the loop open, to realize that these principles take time to digest. So uh, that was my six word update. I've been thinking about that quite a bit this week. Awesome. And so today we're gonna to be talking about how we use the case framework to reduce frustration in your life. So Paul, what is the case framework? <clears throat> All right, well, I get to finally bring out my handy dandy whiteboard here. So the case framework, of course, from Dan Nicholson. So CASE stands for collect, analyze, strategize, and execute. And so what this is, is it's a decision-making framework. It's a way to approach problem solving it's a way to approach issues. It's a way to approach growth and really any business challenge or business decision that you're dealing with. Got it. And this is something that um, we're going to dive deeper into this for sure. Uh, there, uh, there's episode, but we're also going to talk about some more as well at our event. So, um, you know, real quick before we get into all this, what's, what's happening next week? So, Next Friday night and Saturday, we're hosting our Whale Club Certainty events, the first event we've ever hosted. So yeah. uh, we're going to do it big on the first one. We've got a speakeasy rented out on Friday night where it's just going to be a networking event for those who are coming into town uh, a little early. And we're real super excited about that event. The next morning, we are having from uh, 8.30 to 10.30, we're bringing all the whales in to talk about the white paper. Um I'm sure that everybody's heard us talk about this by now. If you've been listening to this show, what we're going to do is we're going to release the first application here in the next few months. That application is going to be on real estate tokenization, which you and I are uh, very, very excited about to say the least. Yep. Then we've got speakers starting at 11. This is going to be led off by uh, the one and only Dr. Jeff Spencer. If you never heard of this guy, um, it's probably because he's coached some of the top performers in, you know, the world. It's a pretty ridiculous resume who he's worked with. So he's going to be leading us off. We're going to hear from Dan Nicholson. We're going to hear from Nick Peterson. And then you and I will both be speaking. And then later in the evening, we're actually doing a casino night. So we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have a big networking event and, uh, you know, basically get to get along with all the, the real estate and blockchain people coming together. We're going to bring yeah. a networking event for that. Yeah. So this is basically where blockchain meets real estate. Um, go to blockchainwells.com. If you guys are interested in attending the event, uh, there's two things I'm, I'm really excited about. Uh, the first one is Saturday morning when we all get together talking about how we're going to tokenize the assets we already have inside the real estate well club, right? So we have a bunch of real estate investors inside the well club 
who have real estate assets that they're tokenizing. So that's something we're actively doing. And I firmly believe that in the next month or two, we are going to so tokenize drive our first asset. Uh, the other thing is I can't get enough of Dr. Jeff Spencer, right? I mean, the fact that he's mentored uh, Tiger Woods, Chris Voss, um, Bono, right? Oprah Winfrey, uh, Lance Armstrong. It's just, it's a ridiculous resume, Jim Quick. So getting to listen to this guy talk about mindset, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for that. So let's jump into case. So collect, what does collect mean? Um, well, one of the growth principles that we talk about in the whale club in the certainty operating system. And this has become one of my most favorite words ever is Dan says we, we require a preponderance of data. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what preponderance means, it means one point doesn't make a trend line. So if this is your, if this is your, uh, you know, you got one point right here, like we can't really do a whole lot with that. We need multiple points in order to be able to draw a trend line. But what do we do as entrepreneurs a lot of times is we take one data point and then we just go run with it. We're going to jump right to strategize and execute. So collect essentially means we need to get the data. What does the data say? As entrepreneurs, we are, we fall victim. I fall victim to this all the time. I can only really speak for myself. I know I have, you and I have a lot in common. Um, have you ever taken off <laughs> and tried to do something without taking the time to actually collect the data more than a single data point? Well, I mean, you look at masterminds, right? You learn, you hear like this brilliant strategy. Okay, this is what this one guy does, right? That's one data point. And right. it auto automatically, <laughs> with that one data point, of course we can replicate exactly what he's done. And we go back and try to execute it. And um, yeah, it's one data point. It's not like two people have figured this out. It's not five people have figured this out. It's like, oh, this one guy's doing this one thing. And now I'm gonna implement it in my business immediately. Right. Well, we were just talking a second ago before we got on here, you and I, or I guess you brought it up as your six word update about the high month paradigm. <laughs> yeah, that's one data well, point. <laughs> tell me about that one. So um, last uh, beginning part of 2021, I was having the best uh, months of my business, of my career, right? Uh, making massive revenue between all the different companies I have combined. And so what do we do, right? We take, <laughs> we make decisions based off the best months we've ever had. And it's not that it's unsustainable, it's just, it's not reliable. And so right. uh, one thing I noticed when I was a realtor was that every realtor you talk about, like, hey, you know, what kind of volume do you do? What kind of transaction count do you do? And everyone always take their best month ever and say, oh, I just do this a month, right? So if they, in their best month ever, they did eight transactions. So oh, I do eight deals a month, right? That's what, how every realtor was it. And I was like, well, when I got into the wholesaling world, it's like, well, they're probably gonna be more you know, professional. And they're not, they're exactly the same. So if a wholesaler has done 10 deals in a month once, hey, you know, tell me about your business. Well, I just do 10 deals a month, right? So we just take this one data point and we just assume and I always thought it was kind of like braggadocious. Maybe they were being, you know, uh, maybe it was just a little white lie. But now that I'm understanding the highest month paradigm, really what it is, is that we identify this is who we are. I am a hundred thousand dollar a month producer, <laughs> and we make our decisions based off of that. So I was making financial decisions uh, as far as uh, expanding the space in this office, hiring more people, spending more on marketing, assuming that my revenue was going to be exactly the same. And unfortunately. It did not. Right. So what we do is like we take that high watermark, you know, the high month paradigm is basically saying we have an amazing month. We have an amazing quarter. Now we got a new high watermark. And what do we want to do as entrepreneurs? We just want to we want to build the business as if that is the new standard. That's right? the baseline. <laughs> It's the baseline, but but really what we need to do when we collect the information is we're building more of like a rolling average. It's not based off the highest month. Um, so what is it do you think that contributes to us skipping that collect phase as entrepreneurs? Uh, I think there's shiny object syndrome. And then naturally, I think over their profiles, we were just designed to be optimistic people. We just think that we always underestimate the amount of effort required. 
and overestimate what we can do in a very short period of time. I think we're just extremely optimistic people because of uh, you wouldn't be an entrepreneur if you weren't an optimistic person. If you didn't have an over, possibly an overdeveloped sense of self-worth. How about like FOMO? There's that too, right? He's I mean, doing you it. see everybody else doing it and you're yeah. like, I made it. Why not me? Why not me? How do I catch up? FOMO doesn't always necessarily mean like missing out. Like if you don't do it now, you'll miss the opportunity. It's, it's, it's sort of like shiny object syndrome. It's another way of saying keeping up with the Joneses and the real estate Joneses. I mean, this is so pervasive in our industry. It's, it's almost like we get pull, you know, I, 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 we, we, we talk about masterminds a lot for the record. I'm a huge fan of masterminds. They have a lot of good that as am I. But when you get all these people in a room, these highly competitive people in a room, the FOMO goes out the roof and it's just, you know, it's keeping up with the Joneses. I mean, you got, if you look at a, a mastermind, you're going to have a bunch of alpha males predominantly, right? I mean, what was really cool when I joined Collective Genius is how many D1 basketball players are in Collective Genius, right? It's uh -huh. crazy, but... Yeah. If you're not super competitive or super driven, you may not get to a point where you'll be in a mastermind. So I think this this keeping up with the real estate Joneses has to happen because of the people that are in it. Mm hmm Well, how about also we talk about the concept, the first wealth commandment is we want to get closer, not chase more. And a recipe for chasing more is not taking time to collect the information. Cause what happens is we just start making decisions based off of like, but I can make more money doing this, but I could, but I could, but I can do these things. Yep. The, it's not necessarily, can you do it? It's it, you should be asking, should I do it? How does this actually help me get closer to the things that I want? Because what we also know is that every decision has an infinite number of trade-offs. So when you adjust to that new high watermark, the question really should be, what are the trade-offs here with doing that? What additional risk have I now added to my business, to my investments by approaching this as a new high watermark? And really the question is, I mean, it's just like we're, we're throwing a whole bunch of uh, uh, tools and wealth commandments that we talk about in the certain TOS. But basically it says, do you have at least three data points? Mm -hmm. You need three data points to make a trend line. So without that, you're just operating based off of emotion. There's no right. data to support your decision in most cases. Unfortunately, no, it's, there was it's not. It's usually either, yeah, it's either FOMO, it's either optimism, shiny object syndrome. I mean, these are just terms that describe the same feelings, but it's like, yeah, that's, that's what I see. Mm -hmm. So what do I have to do then, right? Let's just go back to the highest month paradigm. Do I need to have three months worth of revenue data to, to, to make a new decision? Like what, what, what is the process like for someone like myself, right? I, I, I hit this new watermark. Do I have to wait for a second and third month? Then at that point, this is a trend line. And now I can go and hire more people or spend more money on equipment. Like what is that decision tree like? Yeah. It's a really good question. So I'm going to talk about the growth principles for a second. So this is something we study in the whale club. And you guys are getting like the secret sauce. So number one, we talk about the rule of three and 10. And so what this says is that every time your business triples or does an order of magnitude of 10, it's going to break. What got you there? You know, what got the whale club to 10 people completely had to change when we got to 30 people. Yeah. Reasonable to assume it's going to have to change at 90. And then again, you know, you fall, you get what I'm trying to say here, right? Yep. The systems and the processes, the people oftentimes that got you there aren't going to get you to the next step. Number two, we say we want a preponderance of data. I just love that word. Such an such a such a Dan word. Such an accountant word. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a Dan word. Number three is we want to take micro steps. Right? So you ask me, how do we how do we proceed? Like okay, we had a great month. Well, first of all, do we actually have enough data to really justify expanding? Because number four, 
is we only scale when we hit Well, well, this changes everything. And yeah. so when you're saying, when you catch yourself saying that, the question really should be like, did I predefine this or am I just acting without a preponderance of data because I've got urgency, I've got FOMO, I'm trying to get where I'm going faster. And ultimately what you're doing is you're adding more risk to the system. Yeah. Which causes you to potentially go backwards. Oh, a hundred percent. Because another thing that we talk about is never water the weeds. So what happens is, and we talked about this last week in our thirties, this is, you know, this is Dr. Jeff's life lens. I'm sure if you hang around him, you'll hear this enough, but like in our thirties, it's all about conquest acquisition. And we're trying to acquire all these businesses. We're trying to acquire all these properties. We've got now all these employees and all these things. And our biggest liability are the obligations that we take on. Right. Yep. So as we accumulate, you know, that's why the high month paradigm is so dangerous because now we think, oh, well, now, now we're going to adjust to this new high water mark and we take on more employees. We take on more risk, which is essentially more obligation, which again, keeps us oftentimes from getting closer to the things that we really want. I mean, you and I were had this conversation last night when we were talking and I said, you know, it's funny, I got into real estate to be a passive real estate investor. And I look back two years later and it's like, I sure am pretty active in this quote, passive business that I right. wanted to start. Right. <laughs> so we just make decisions oftentimes because it's like, yeah, but I can make more or it's our ego that jumps in the way or it's urgency or FOMO. I mean, everybody has their, you know, kind of uh, Achilles heel, so to speak. But the more we can use these operating principles and make sound decisions through through an operating system. That's why we have these things because it's so easy to let our human mindset take over. Yeah, so that's collecting. So is that enough data now? We got three, three data points? So yes, and, and, the, and the answer if you don't have enough data is to micro step. What can we do to get some data, mm -hmm. right? So you have a great month, you wanna do these things, you wanna expand. Right. But, but we really only had one month. So the question might be, well, how can I get some additional data? And if I don't have that data, how can I take a small micro step forward that can then justify the next step? Everybody yeah. wants to try to, you know, we said, um, I say this to my team all the time. Our strategy is to test and learn, not plan and implement. The problem with making this big giant plan and then we're going to go implement it is guess what? We're not like things change, right? Things change constantly. New data is coming in. Ver new variables are getting introduced. I was talking to and someone, problem I was talking to someone that I really respect, you know, and he says, Hey, I want to, you know, for, for 2023, I'm going to, uh, launch a course. I'm going to create a course. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, promote it. I'm going to sell it. I was like, Hey, that's awesome. Right, because I respect what you do, and you're one of the top in the field. He's and he's like, who should I have help me do this? Like, well, you can go with this tiered person. They're like, well, who are you using? He's like, well, we're not using that person. We're using a much higher tiered person. They're like, I want to use your person. And I said to him, I was like, you don't even know if you're gonna like creating content. You don't right. even know if you're gonna be comfortable in front of a camera. You don't know if you're gonna commit to recording content. You don't know if this is something an avenue you actually want to go through. You wrote it down, right? You're part of your strategic planning for 2023, but you don't know how much you're going to enjoy doing all the things that are required to do it. Let's not get the highest...
that might be a micro step that you take. And so again, because I have that orientation towards just jumping right to strategize and execute. In fact, a lot of times just skipping strategize, just go right to let's just get it done. Yeah. Well, I think that's a combination of our profile, right? As far as like a, a high driver personality, but on top of that as well, you and I both took the Colby and you're also a quick start. So like we're both destined to like just go all in without all the information. So uh, that's collecting. What about analyze? Analyze. Yeah. So, you know, I was given some thought to what do I mean by that? And, and, and I would say like the first filter in analyze is, let me go here. Is this a preference? Because a lot of times we ask, you know, we've, we, the, sec, the second wealth commandment is we have to remember the difference between preference and binary. Binary means this, there's like there's a right and wrong answer. So the first question, like, should I do something? Well, first of all, are you asking a preference-based question as if it's binary? Because if it's preference, let's recognize that right off the bat. Right. Like you want to do this because you, this is one of your preferences. It's not right or wrong. Someone telling you, Hey, you shouldn't do that. Doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, so is it a preference? And then the second thing is, does it get us closer and not more? Right. So when we're analyzing the data, does it help us get closer to the things that we want? Or are we just like collecting data to collect data? So the, the best, the great example, man, like this whole idea about high month paradigm, we have this amazing high month and we're like, well, let's wait, let's wait a month or two. Mm -hmm. We get some more data. And then it's like, we had another really solid couple months. We're like, well, I got the data. Right. Let's scale this business. Yeah. But and even then, right. Is that. Does this get me closer to what I want, right? So let's say Amen. I go back and say, okay, so I had three record months, right? I'm making more revenue than I ever had before. So I have three record months. Then the question is, okay, this idea that I want to pursue, does this idea that I want to execute potentially get me closer? Or, is I'm not, am, or am I doing this because I want to keep up with the Joneses? Am I doing right. this because I want to, uh, uh, you know, build up our, our image, our ego, our social media presence? Right. So there's yeah. that one part. And then uh, you said that's closer or, or is this uh, because I just want to do more. I just want to do more revenue. Right. OK, I had a record month. Let's see if we can 3x that amount. Let's see if we can double that amount. So there's that stopping and asking yourself these questions. Right. And so this is what we call the professional skeptic frame. Mm hmm. which basically asks why can you prove it? You've heard of a three by five. Why? Uh, no, elaborate on it. So a three by five. Why this is something we used in engineering. It is a failure mode analysis tool. Basically it helps us get to the root cause of something. And so mm -hmm. think about a kid who's always just asking you like, why dad, why? Why should I do that? And, you know, we, we should adopt that frame with our, with our business as, a, as if we're a professional skeptic. So it's like, hey, we had three months in a row, so we want to scale the business. Well, why? Because I want to make more money. Why? So that I can create passive income. Okay. So does scaling an active business that's going to take you more time and energy and effort, does that actually help you get passive time back? A lot of times we just get that confused. It's yep. like, so I, you know, I look at this and I say, really, what is the problem we're trying to solve? It comes back to, you know, this term that Dan has that you're going to be speaking on in a few weeks mm -hmm. during the whale club trademark. <laughs> Got to make sure we have that in there. Um, this is what we teach people to do in the whale club, how to actually find their solvable problem as you know, right? Yep. Every business has a solvable problem, which means like, why are you using this business? Mm -hmm. Did you get into real estate to have a passive business or are you trying to, are you actually creating more work for yourself? Well, let me ask Just you, you because, say that every business has a solvable problem. Does it or... 
I, I think most people ha are, are kind of murky. I don't think everyone that has a, has an answer to solve a problem. I think that they get into it for, for a reason and it's a lofty idea and not lofty, but it's a dream. But I don't think everyone gets into a point where like, okay, now I know exactly what I want and I know what it's going to take to get there. I think we have an idea of I want more and I know how to get more. And I think that's about as much research as we do. No one has clarity. Like yeah. We get into business and then we start making decisions. Right. And it's like, wait, <laughs> like decisions in reference to what? Like I, I use the Google Maps example all the time. You know, when you get into Google Maps, it, it asks you two questions. Like, where are you right now? And where are you going? Mm -hmm. And we'll work out the most efficient path to get there. Yeah. So, but if you were, so I cut you but, off, right? So you're talking about the solvable problem, right? So uh, I finished explaining that. And then where, where, where were we going with the solvable problem? So when we analyze our decisions, we have to bring it back to the compass. Where are we going? You know, it's, it's, Okay, what good does it ha do to have data if you don't know what you're optimizing for? Yeah. And we say this as like, otherwise you'll just, your default, because the human default is to just chase more and mm -hmm. more and more. And that's a recipe to collect a whole bunch of obligations that actually could get, be getting you further away from the things that you want. We're not saying it's bad to make a bunch of money in business. I, I intend to make a bunch of money in business. I'm sure you do too. Oh, 100%. But we want to do it with this orientation that Dan talks about. Least amount of risk. Least amount of effort. Most amount of options because resources are scarce. We don't have unlimited resources in business, in our personal life, in our investments. We don't. We're not a Fortune 500 company. We can't just throw around millions and billions of dollars, whatever. Like we have to recognize that resources are scarce. And so all this time that we just jump without data, without analyzing something, whether it's getting us closer to our solvable problem, we just start making decisions. We're increasing the risk, which means we're reducing the likelihood we get what we want. It's going to take a heck of a lot more effort now because we've got to maintain all these things that we've acquired and these assets and all these obligations we now have. And because we have to maintain all those things, our options of what we can do now go way down. So we, even if we found a more efficient path forward, good luck. Right. We might not be able to do it because we tied our hands with fewer options. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's analyze. Okay. So we've analyzed it. We've done, we've gone through this. We've identified our solve a problem. We've asked our questions and the answers are yes. So what's next? So we have decided, um, that. Okay. So, I'm so we got the data, that. we got the trend line. So we want to first go through questions. Hmm? We want to first go through preferences. Then we want to filter it through. Well, actually, that's probably going too deep. Let's just stay out of this. Let's talk about it in a different way. So we've got stra uh, um, strategize. Mm -hmm. What that means is kind of towards that orientation. We talked about least amount of risk, least amount of effort, most amount of options. So we've collected this data. We said, yeah, we're going to, we want to scale this business because it actually helps us get closer to the things that we want. And, and let me say this, like for everybody that's in business, not everybody's in it just to make a ton of money. Um, I want to use another acronym that we get from Dan. We're throwing all the goodies out there today. Um, we've talked about timer. Right? You and mm -hmm. I? Yep. So these are currencies that we trade. Money, energy. I say relationships slash reputation. So this is 
this is a framework for saying, okay, if we're going to build a strategy to go and execute on, we need to consider the trade-offs. So there, there might be a time, like I'm in the time of my life right now where I'm willing to trade my time and my energy, like almost all of it. I uh-huh. leave it on the field every week. That's it for, for money. Like, let's call it like it is. Like I am trying to get my solvable problem funded, trying to fund the things that I want in life on my timeline and on my terms. That's what financial certainty means. But there's, there's other people. Let's take Eric Brewer for an example, like yeah. you and Eric are good buddies. You guys have, uh, you know, this Novation deal. It's a freaking awesome product. I love it. Little plug for your Novation product there. Um, but like, what do you think is driving Eric Brewer right now? You think it's money? Like maybe, but I have a feeling it's probably impact. Yeah. He's trying to make an impact. He's trying to grow a big team because he gets so much energy influencing and impacting lives. I would argue you probably have that vein as well. Absolutely. So it's not always about money, but it's important to recognize what currency are we trading for another? Because every time we make a decision, there's an infinite number of trade-offs. We don't have unlimited resources. And I think, you know, we were talking about earlier masterminds, like what are we, what are we doing in the mastermind? We're trading our time and our money and effort more relationships, valuable relationships, Bingo. right? Bingo. Uh, we uh, expense, we'll, we'll put our time and effort into something to improve our reputation. So yeah, absolutely. The, the, the trade-offs are timer. And I never really thought about it in this sense until we heard it from Dan. Right. So this is just another version of saying like, what, what game are you playing? Because if you're building a strategy that actually gets you less of the things of the currencies you actually want, because, you know, again, it could be, let's say we, we, we use this example all the time, but let's say you, you want to own your business so that it can be passive because you are wanting to spend all your free time with your, your young kids, right? Dan uses this analogy all the time. He's got three, uh, two girls, I guess that are, um, I think eight and 10, something like that. And he jokes all the time. He's like, in a few years, they're not going to want anything to do with me. And so what, do, you know, what does Dan do? He's like, I'm sorry, guys, I'm in Disney World. Yeah. Like, sorry, I'm on vacation with my kids. Sorry, I can't do it because of this. I've he noticed he's had, on vacation a lot. He, he, <laughs> it's because he's with his kids. Right. Right. He's going to Hawaii to take the kids because it was the summertime, right? The kids are off. So he has understood that his strategy has to align with the game that he's actually playing. Because when we say, yeah, just because you can scale your business, but like, are you really just trying, are you trying to get more money or are you using this business to get more relationships or are you using to make an impact on your family or influence your kids? Like there's, it just comes back to lack of clarity. Mm -hmm. Most people can't really build functional strategies because they don't really know what they want. Right. So then a strategize then is figuring out which resources we're willing to give up within the timer uh, acronym or uh, other currencies within the timer acronym. I would say that's, yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, This, this is something that's got to be considered for different domains. So when we talk about business, when we talk about personal life and we talk about our investments, right? Let's let's use an example. Let's let's talk about guard for a second. Yeah. Because you and I both like guard. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, you know, I dollar cost averaged in for the first couple months, right? Got a lot of my money positioned, and then it ripped. And so. What I didn't do, the the mistake that I made was the strategy was to just sit there and watch charts all day. But there's an impact to my energy, my effort, like the dopamine that's firing every single day, watching charts, trying to decide whether you should buy or sell. Mm -hmm. Like I needed a different strategy than just buying and holding guard. So what did we do? We paired it with guard BUSD so we could earn passive income in a liquidity pool. I know most people are going to be like, what the hell did you just say? But like, 
that strategy allowed me to get my energy back. Like I don't, I don't have to waste a bunch of energy watching right. charts now. And I got my time back because, because crypto should not take up a lot of my time and my energy. No, it should not. I want it to make money. That's why I'm doing it. So that's strategize. And then the last thing is execute. So what's yep. execute? It means just go get it done, right? Like this just means like, um, is this, is this a matter of, mean, of, of allocating or reallocating your resources? Uh, to to uh, accomplish your objective, what what else goes into it? So let's let's take an example and let's use one of the ones that we've been using. So your business is you know you got your high 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 month paradigm, but actually we've got some data to indicate like we're just crushing it. You know we've done this now for a, for a few months, and I guess let me put a little caveat on that because that's probably not enough to to tell whether you've got cycles in quarters, like a different time, like you could have had June, July, August was like crazy good. Mm -hmm. And you're like, Hey, it's, you know, it's going to be the summer forever. And, <laughs> and then, and then winter comes around and you're back down. So like some businesses are going to need longer timeframes to see data. The longer the time frame you have, the more accurate the data, of course. But let's assume you have that you've got, um, You've analyzed it through the lenses that we talk about. Does this actually help me get closer? Um, and so then as we execute, one of the things that I think comes to mind is building micro strategies in line with macro belief. So if we're going to go out and execute on this, is this actually helping us get more of the things that we want? And we want to take micro steps as often as possible. Because again, it comes back to the thing I was mentioning about test and learn versus plan and implement. Mm -hmm. Let's, when we say execute, it's like, how can we execute in the smallest way possible that we get feedback from the system. You know, this reminds me of the book. Uh, what is it called? Um, startup, uh, shoot the lean startup. And, and it's this like Silicon Valley style of fail fast. Mm -hmm. I like that because like, how can we execute and get some feedback into the system and then run it back through the case framework, right? We're trying to get data. We've got some data. We figured out like, yeah, this actually helps us get closer. What's the strategy that we're going to, that we're going to actually execute on. And we execute on it, yeah. get feedback and bring it back through. Yeah. But, yeah. but what we do is we just plan and we implement and then we forget to come back to say like, does this still make sense uh, with the data that we have now? What do we do? So I think, uh, you know, you look at, Collect, right? Three, at least start at three data points to get a trend line, analyze, strategize, and execute. And I think a lot of us as entrepreneurs, business owners, is we'll collect one data point and maybe not even one collect, not, maybe not even one data point. It could be like a theoretical, like, hey, this might work. And we go from one data point or half a data point, we skip analyze, we skip strategize, and then we go execute and expand all our resources. And it's not just time and money and effort. It's also we're losing our relationships within our organization because we're asking people to spin their wheels and they're frustrated because we're always whipsawing them back and forth. Yes. Um, you know, one of the things we hear at Collective Genius all the time when I'm there, they, they do a good job of saying this over and over and over again. Of course, I've, I tend to forget it when I actually get home, which is like, take one or two things from here and go back and implement it. You're going to drive your team crazy if you come back and you're like, we're going to do this. 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 Mm -hmm. Which is what I used to do. I would go back right. and say, all right, scrap everything. Here's the new vision, right? Every quarter. Here's the new vision. Here's the new roadmap. Drove yeah. my team crazy. It's okay to change. We want to, we, when we have new data, we need to adjust, but a single data point is not, um, 
Well, you know, I think about this in the opposite direction because, you know, I'm still new in business. So the sales are just like wonky, like all over the place. And really what it comes into me is when, when we have two months or three months that just aren't really good. First thing I want to do is go start changing everything. Rip this thing out. We got to get rid of this. We got to hire a new vendor here. We got to fire this person, hire a new, you know, contractor. Yeah. This guy sucks. We've been using Whatever. this product for three months and we, or for three weeks and we've got zero results. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So sometimes you just have to bring it back to say like, you need time and system to really see what's going on. And as business owners, that's difficult because our emotions, like we know this, everything comes in through the human mindset, which is, you know, the system one brain, which is like your fight or flight response, like the old brain, we're processing things through that. And, and oftentimes we don't get out of that emotional state into like the logical objective state. Yeah. We make emotional decisions and then we add our logic on that to justify it. Well, this for hasn't sure. worked for three weeks, so we got to get rid of this thing. So, um, you know, and these are the kind of things that we're going to be talking about at our event, right? And you're talking about the human mindset. That's what Dr. Jeff Spencer talks about. Uh, and then these are kind of things, com kinds of conversations we're having within the whale club. So, we titled the show using the case framework to eliminate frustration. So we've explained case. So how does case eliminate frustration? Um, frustration, I think, comes from not having clarity. We don't know what we want. And we don't know whether we're getting closer to the things that we want. Yeah. We're just making decisions. We're acquiring things because we're like, I can make more money here. Or... I can do more deals if I do this. Not saying that's bad. We're just saying like, what is closer for you? What is your solvable problem for your business, yeah. your investments, your personal life? So I know I, I've mentored, I don't know, hundreds of people. And I can say one of the biggest frustrations that I inflicted on people I was mentoring was it's like, Steve, I want to do this. I want to scale. I want to grow. I want to scale. I want to grow. And me having done the scaling and growing thing in the, you know, the contest where we're measuring, right? Having gone through all this, I've learned that scaling and growing is not all that is meant to be or not all that it seems to be, right? And I think scaling and growing makes sense if, it, if it's in line with what you're trying to do. So anytime someone said, I want to grow, I want to scale, I would always ask them those questions. You're talking about the three by five. Why do you want to grow? Why do you want to scale? And instead of talking them out of scaling and growing, which is what I was doing wrong as a mentor, I should have been asking, is this in line with your solvable problem? Is this in line with what you've told yourself that you want to get in business for? Why you started this entrepreneurial journey? Because of scaling and growing, and you know, that's growing a sales team, that's spending money on marketing, that's overhead on a lease, right? Uh, if you're in a commercial building, all these things, more obligations, more risk is not in line with what you told yourself before, then maybe you need to sit down and, and, and analyze, right? But I wasn't saying that. I would just say, you don't want to do this. <laughs> I was talking them out of it and frustrating them. And that's kind of all that, <laughs> where it would end at that time. Yeah, I want to I want to touch on something else that we talked about the other week with Nick, which is the barbell mm -hmm. strategy. So I'm going to draw a terrible barbell here. Uh, as you're drawing this terrible barbell, one second, guys, are there any case in points for you guys? Like as, as Paul and I are talking about this, you know, put in the chat here. What part of this is resonating for you guys? Because we're sharing our pains, definitely sharing my pains, right? Like I said, we started this with uh, uh, highest month paradigm nearly ruined me. So what part of this is resonating for you guys uh, as Paul and I are talking about this? So let's talk about the barbell again, because it's so relevant when we, when we discuss, well, should I scale this business or not? And my first question is, where does that business fall for you? Is this a reliable business? And you're scaling additional reliability because what reliability means to me, low effort, low risk. 
Okay. I think we say reliability all the time. This is the best example I've thought of of reliability. What if I told you that your car was 90% reliable, which means that every time you get in it, nine times out of 10, you're going to get where you're going. But one time out of 10, you're not going to get where you're going. Something's going to happen with that car. Would you, would you drive that car? Probably not. It's still 90%. Even if it was 95%, one out of 20. So like once a month, once a month, your car is going to break down. Like, great. I still wouldn't drive that thing. 99% three times a year, let's say, no, it would still fail. So when we talk about where does the, where does your business fit? Is it a reliable business? Does it take low effort? Is it very low risk? Another way of saying this is like predictable. Yeah. I think uh, we talked about this yesterday on part in the disruption, Eric Brewer, you know, I'm not trying to plug his name over and over again, but he brought this up and he said, you know, like I would look at a company, I would feel comfortable investing in a company where I know the owner can take regular vacations. Right. Right. If the right. owner can take regular vacations, that's a reliable company. That's a predictable revenue. So we're talking about reliability. I think, you know, for your barbell example, a business where the owner is not actively involved because that's least amount of effort, right? Least amount of risk. He doesn't have to keep pouring money into it. He doesn't have to keep driving up the marketing. This is a predictable business. So that's where I would, I would park for reliability, I would say a, a business where an owner can take a vacation on a regular basis, not like once, a, great. not once a year and, and they're plugged in <laughs> checking their emails on the beach. That's exactly right. Like if you don't have a business that can do that, it's not reliable. You have a job, a J O B. Yeah. Like you have just now scaled and we get into business all the, a lot of times, like anything new has high upside and you know, then we get this, this high month paradigm, this high month mark, and we want to adjust. But the question is, is like, where does it fit? Is this business high upside, which again is also still, I would say low effort. Um, well, maybe not necessarily low effort. It could mean that in certain cases, but like, it's just important to recognize, are you scaling a business that's actually a job? Like this is where your job is, right in the middle of the barbell. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels so, like work every day. So yeah, so what I would say is, is if you're thinking about scaling your business, first question I would ask is, how do we pull all the weeds out of this garden so that we're not watering the weeds? Because we, because we realize that resources are limited. We need yep. to recapture and reallocate those resources to a higher upside. And I always say this like. I got into real estate for, for it to be passive. Real estate needs to be passive as, as passive as possible for me. Yeah. And I always say this as like, it just needs to be boring. Let's just make it a boring business that just runs. It's just predictable. It just spits out cash, right? If we can have that, then we free up a lot of our time and resources. We talked about timer, all of our currencies to go after things with higher upside that we can then shift to the reliable side. It may mean going into a new market to try to find additional upside in the same business, yep. right? You could have a barbell inside your business. You have your reliable side and then you focus on the upside, but the reliable side needs to get easier and easier and easier. You want the upside to get bigger and bigger and bigger with less risk. Well, I think the probably the classic example or the one that's easiest for, uh, to understand for all of us in real estate is marketing, right? So like direct mail, right? It's usually you spend this much in direct mail, you send this many pieces, you can get this many calls, you can get this many contracts. That's predictable. Not a lot of effort, some risk, but not a lot of risk because you know you have the data to prove it, right? And it's, uh, uh, so I, I would put that on the reliable side. And then we say, okay, now we want to go to the upside. This could be Google pay-per-click. This could be TV, well, Hold on a second. Radio. Let me, let me back up to the direct mail. Cause I've got a point. It depends on the operator. Yeah. So for me, because we were such a young business and we didn't have the lead manager in place, we didn't have our CRM and everything perfectly dialed in. We didn't have the, the automated drip campaigns. Like we were paying for this data, paying for this mail. We'd get these leads, we'd scrape off the top and then the rest of them we'd leave. Now, sometimes we close those deals on the top, but sometimes we didn't. So right. for us, it wasn't reliable. 
So it depends business to business. It's not like saying this thing is reliable and this thing is upside. Like, you know, you know, well, that I struggle with flips. Like I just, we just, we're terrible at flips. I don't do them well. There's <laughs> so many the people boat. in TV who are like, that's our bread and butter, man. That is, that is a, as reliable as it gets. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, it, it's not an objective thing. This is bad. This is good. But I mean, in it general, depends on the operator. for the operator, it could be direct mail. It could be cold calling. It could be a uh, sphere of influence, right? It could just be, you're really good with nursing homes, right? Yeah. If you got your one marketing channel, that's your reliable. And then when we inject this other marketing uh, to the company, this is the upside play, right? So I think it doesn't have to be your company has to be reliable or upside. It could be this marketing is reliable or upside, or it could be a salesperson, right? You could have this great salesperson and you got this other potentially uh, uh, talented salesperson trying to recruit for another company. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be bringing them in for reliability. You might be bringing them for upside. So it doesn't have to be for a company. It could be uh, departmental. It could be inter, right? It could be a, sub, a subset within your department. So just want to add that other layer into there, into there as well. There's barbells inside of barbells inside of barbells. Like you zoom in and there's just like continues to be more and more barbells. And so like this, this framework, again, bring it back to case is just a way to, to better execute and, and really just to better analyze, strategize and execute on your decisions. Where does it fit? Am I scaling, uh, an upside play here because <laughs> we don't really want to do that. We want to get data back. We want to make it reliable. Then we can scale it. Right. So, Again, with the least amount of risk, least amount of effort. So and that's it, right? So that's how we use the case framework to eliminate frustration. So um, guys, if you guys want to, or I hope to see you guys in Denver next week with Paul with Nick Peterson, Dan Nicholson, Dr. Jeff Spencer, and a bunch of other people that have gone through the Whale Club already. If you want to you know, meet some of the other cohorts, go to blockchainwhales.com. Hope to see you guys there. Until then, we won't be doing this next week because we're going to be in Denver. So I'll see you guys in two weeks. See you all later.